Here we go. Welcome to a fine time for healing, a place where your physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being are all that matter. I am your host, Randy Fine. If you like this channel, if you're enjoying the videos that I'm putting up there and the podcast that I'm putting up there probably like twice a week, please subscribe to the channel. That way you will be notified every time a new one comes up. And I promise you, there's a lot coming up. Um, and if you like the videos, give us a thumbs up. Today we have um, a really interesting topic. Uh, it can be a little bit heavy, but it's real important for us to talk about it. Um, Cindy, I don't have your bio here, so I'm going to, oh, okay. So, so today we're with Cindy Benezra, and she is an entrepreneur, philanthropist, sexual abuse advocate, and author of Under the Orange Blossom. And in this book, Under the Orange Blossom, she talks about her experience um, as a child, experiencing sexual abuse, and the process that it took through her life. Welcome, Cindy. Great to be here, and thank you for having me. You're very, you're very welcome. Tell us uh, what what the reason was for you writing Under the Orange Blossom. Um, well, I have to say this is something that I wanted to share always with somebody, but um, I never had enough courage or I didn't have a voice actually. Um, when you suffer trauma or abuse um, in different forms or just abuse in general, you uh, become very fearful of of life, I guess you could say, and also fearful for your life. And I lost my voice in the process. And it was something that I felt growing up, I wanted to share, but I had no one to share with because I trusted no one. And um, after the abuse ended, uh, it was always the secret that I kept, a family secret that was uh, that I felt bound to keep. Um, when you're growing in a dysfunctional family, you don't really understand that secrets don't really serve you, especially in this case. They don't. You don't know that until you become, until you actually step outside of it. Then you realize the damage um, that you hold in this. So when I became older, um, I started sharing and sharing more that I came from a dysfunctional family or that I was sexually abused or physically abused or emotionally abused. And every time I would share that, um, I would get different responses. And I found that people um, never really wanted to talk about it because it's uncomfortable, first of all. Uh, talking about sexual abuse is not cocktail conversation or cocktail worthy. And um, people would always say, ooh, that's a heavy subject. And then as I even became older, I realized like, as I looked at the statistics, one in four girls, one in six boys, um, it's depending on, <laughs> on where you're looking, but that's the statistics that I have found. And I thought this is just epidemic. And still we do not, find a, um, ways to talk about these things, talk about how, um, how this is, um, it's almost commonplace. It's, it's absurd to think about. I know. And I'm so sorry that, that that happened to you. Um, I know that the other side of it is tremendous healing when you can move past it, but, um, it does come with a lot of shame and mm -hmm. the secrets um, that you're carrying can really destroy you from the inside out. It's, um, yeah. it's important to get this out. And a book is a great way to do it. When I wrote my memoir um, years ago, uh, it was the most liberating thing ever. I just told the story, you know, and um, I just, I was fearless. I just did it, you know. So good for you. Um, yeah. And my specialty, my expertise is in narcissistic abuse. So most of the people watching here are going to be survivors of some sort of emotional 
psychological, mental abuse, perhaps physical, sexual, financial, or spiritual. But uh, narcissistic abuse runs the gamut of all of them. And mm -hmm. so we're, you know, we're very sensitive to this topic. We know um, how difficult it is. I also am a coach. I work with people who have been abused this way. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed with clients who come to me who have had childhood sexual sexual abuse is kind of what you said a few minutes ago. They're very, um, they, they don't trust. They don't trust. Right. And the trust varies. They could trust right. me one day and the next day really not want to say anything. So can you talk about that a little bit, why that happens? Per, uh, personally, um, that's, it's, it's confusing because at times you feel people are, you're more, well, okay. When we wake up, it just depends how the stars and moons are aligned. We wake up and we we're feeling more open. I think it's an individual thing. And it also has to do with how, how your day is going or how you're feeling. And some days I would open up and I would trust somebody, but then maybe possibly a response or a comment or a look, or maybe I would internalize that I shared too much and I would feel so much shame around that. Even if, if it was just a, cause a person coming from forms of trauma and abuse, I believe they are more intuitive um, because you've had to read the room. You've had to read your, your perpetrator. You've had to go and feel a silence and understand it becomes this hypervigilance and you have to look and read because you are always, always, it's like living in an ER room. You're just waiting for something to happen and it's a constant fear so when you are with another person and you share this with them you're almost waiting for um a feeling a dis a dis like a shit you're you're looking for a body language or a signal that stresses or maybe like your belief system that you are shameful, that you, this is an, a terrible thing, that you are ugly, that you are dirty, that whatever the, the name that you put on the label that you call yourself, you are looking for almost for those affirmations of the things um, that you don't want to be told, but you tell yourself. It's almost like you have the script about yourself in life, that you're not worthy to be loved, that you are uh, a terrible person, that you're ugly, that you're stupid, or whatever it is that your parent may have told you, you carry all these little banners in life. Mm -hmm. And even though you don't want to believe it, it is a very deep rooted um, script that you carry in life. And I think that's part of the reason why you're so cautious. Okay. What, what do you feel about that? I, and I agree. I agree with a lot of what you said, because sexual abuse is, is a bit different than strictly emotional abuse. Um, it works on you in a very different way, but there's still the shame mm -hmm. and the feeling that there's something wrong with you because right. you've been told that there's something wrong with you and you do carry that. Uh, but what you said about the energetic sensitivity, that is absolutely true. Uh, and everyone who works with me, actually, I write articles about this too, about uh, empaths, because you're right. You're hyper vigilant as a child because that's your survival. Right. If you've got to know, you've got to feel the air around you and know when it's about to change because things come out of nowhere. So that makes it even more difficult as an adult survivor. Mm -hmm. to navigate this world because now you're energetically sensitive and you're right. picking up feelings, emotions, moods, thoughts from other people when you're out. So it complicates the issue that you're trying to work on. Um, yeah. 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 I think, and that um, eventually you realize through my healing process, I realized that this was a great survival tool, that it, it saved my life. Um, 
And also, I think through my teenage years, I think I realized too that it it kept me out of trouble. So I, I look at it now and going, okay, yes, they, it was great. But however, when you become older and you're in the working field and as you're going through your healing process, you also recognize that in a lot of ways, it's your detriment that you have to let it go and not hold on to <laughs> almost stop reading and just surrender and let it go that you are going to be okay. You are in control of yourself. You, you are safe. You have survived and you've lived through it. And I think that's sort of the, one of the things that, that, um, a lot of survivors kind of go through this epiphany, like, okay, I I've come through it and I could let some of these tools that have saved my life just, um, they don't serve me right now. Exactly. And mm -hmm. you're right because the way that you adapt as a child is not going to be a healthy coping um, strategy because as a child, you don't have that built into you. So your subconscious is sort of taking over and helping you survive this. So you don't go psychotic, you know? Right. And so your subconscious steps in and it creates some way for you to deal with it, whether it be uh, dissociation or, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, denial or whatever it is. Uh, but the problem is, as you say, when this has been your coping strategy through childhood, you don't realize that this is the only coping strategy, you know, and then you take it into your adult life and it doesn't work there. True. True. I think it also causes, um, detachment, uh, from relationships and, um, that took me a while to figure out why I couldn't, um, why I was so cautious and why I couldn't attach or what was my resistance in this. And it, it really took me a while, lots of therapy. I have had a lifetime full of therapy. And so my abuse happened from five to 10. Um, they are very, very pivotal years. Um, developmentally. And I think from that time it, onward, um, I even forgot that these things happened. They came in forms of, of um, nightmares, dreams. And in my teen years, I was about 16 and I was becoming sexually active or thinking about it. And it started to come in my dreams. But where I was going with this is that um, the attachment part of it, it's, and dissociation, that type of thing, those type of behaviors, you don't really realize a lot of that until you be, you're start to work through the therapy and you can kind of have, you know, epiph epiphanies and just kind of go, oh, that's what I've been doing. And that has not serving me, but I think it, it, you have to go through the work, um, or maybe some form of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And, and, um, and what's, you know, what's complicated about this is that this is so multi layered and stacked, the trauma is so stacked one on top of the other, that there's no way to release it all at once. And so you will release it in stages, you know, you will get to a place where you're really feeling great and functioning well. And then boom, a year or two later, you get hit with something else because it's going to come up in in bites the ways that you can manage it emotionally manage it so uh it is it is quite complicated and it it mm -hmm. does take time mm -hmm. yeah. i am still in awe of this process that from one to from excuse me from five to ten where i suffered this trauma but now i'm reaching 60 and I am still searching for healing. And um, I realize that um, I am, I've always been whole, I guess you could say that maybe I had little gaps in my, in my development, but I've always been whole. And I don't think I realized that until later I go, oh, I was always whole. I just didn't know that I was whole. Um, but I'm still in awe that it takes such effort 
to um, go through these stages because your mind could only allow you to absorb so much and you have to take a break from it. It's not a magic pill. There's not a magic wand. There's not a, it's a process and it's a, a willingness to mm. want to find healing, I think, to what level and what degree. And hopefully some other things, other great things happen along that way of that healing path too. What was the hardest thing to let go of? Was it shame? Was it guilt? Um, guilt. Guilt. It was guilt. Guilt. Yeah. I really didn't. I mean, I did have mm -hmm. shame. Uh, shame when I would share with somebody else. Um, but I felt a lot of times that I didn't own that shame. It was my father, the perpetrator, who really was that person who should own that shame. Um, but since he is a narcissist, <laughs> didn't own that shame. And that was a very hard uh, spot in my life and mm -hmm. um, still is hard for me to understand that. But I do remember when I was 16 and I was having these nightmares and I realized that I most likely had been sexually abused and I confronted my father and the way he said, did you read this? Did you see this in a movie? Did you, you know, like what is going through your mind? Like, oh, poor you, like you're, you're delusional. You're the crazy person. And I remember looking at him and just looking at his blue eyes and staring across me and going through all these ranges of emotions. And I thought, oh my gosh, this, this is actually really true. And I think that's when I realized like my dad's ill like he's he's like he just won an oscar for his performance of three different types of personality in there and i just thought i'm working with a crazy man a psychopath like yeah it's hard to um live in a kind of a household with a narcissist right it is mm -hmm. i mean and your father uh he went that extra step it's not typical for narcissist people with narcissistic personality disorder to uh, sexually abuse or even physically abuse because they have the power of the mind and they don't really need to do that. But there's uh, in the cluster B disorders, there's also psychopathy, sociopathy, which are under the umbrella of antisocial, there's histrionic and borderline. And not no one cluster B personality disorder exists alone. So there's always aspects of others. So when I hear about somebody who's a physical abuser, sexual abuser, something like that, then I know that there's antisocial there because that's not a typical thing for a narcissist. Um, so your father, you know, and, and who knows what was stronger because every psych psychopath and sociopath is narcissistic. Not every narcissist is a psychopath or a sociopath. So it's hard to say what the, you know, what the main um, disorder was, but it definitely had elements of narcissistic personality disorder. And with that, um, it, the, the hardest thing is that you never get validation. Never, 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 never. And uh, one of the things that I do with people as we work together is I work on them having self-validation because it's all you've got. You, if you are, you know, as a child growing up in a in, in an environment like you did, you were only as good as you were told you were in that moment. Mm -hmm. And right. Mm -hmm. And so when you get out into the world, you're looking for validation. Am mm -hmm. I good? Am I good enough? Am I pretty enough? Am I doing this right? Is this the right decision? And it's very difficult to live like that as an adult. Have you experienced that needing a validation? Uh, yes, uh, I have to say, um, my father is also a borderline personality. Um, but I was very, very loved by my mother. Mm -hmm. So I did, I do have um, memories full of, of validation and love. And I think um, because of that, I 
you know, everyone's process is different, but because of that, I didn't really suffer so much of that, but I understand what you're talking about. I think when it came to um, relationships in dating, that was um, a process. And that's mainly why I started looking into therapy very heavily before I started to date um, I'm, I married and I had, um, I had children at the time and I thought, oh, I'm not going back into a relationship unless I figure out exactly who I am in relationships and how can I improve my life and how do I become validated within myself before I find it in a partner. Mm -hmm. So I worked on that. And then even when I met my my current husband. And when I met him, I said, okay, we're going to therapy and your children are going to therapy. I mean, I brought everybody into therapy. I didn't want to have repeat any of the cycles that I had in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's very wise. And, and what you said about it affecting your relationships, this is where it shows up in adulthood. We can go along just fine, but as soon as we start having adult relationships, all of it shows up. Mm, I believe so that, that, you know, that lack of validation and everything like that, you know, for people who don't have relationships, you know, they can chug along for a while. But the minute they try to engage with somebody on that level of intimacy, all the fears, all the insecurities, all the shame, all the, the, the um, limiting beliefs, they all start popping out. And, um, it's very difficult. And I, I like what you said, because we can't bring a broken person into a relationship and expect it to work. Right. And we're not going to choose someone that's best for us. We're going to choose, we're going to, going to repeat patterns if we don't heal the past. I, be, I thoroughly believe that. I think, um, although it, this is interesting. I, I have to say, maybe you can help me with this. Um, when I, so here was I, okay. I was 16. Um, my father is a true pedophile. So when I became 10, my father stopped abusing me because I started to go through puberty. Mm -hmm. He also abused, um, I was sexually abused other children in the neighborhood that I did not find out until I was an adult. Um, but where I'm going with this is that in this, in this process of being an adult, I realized that there was a lot of uh, guilt in knowing that uh, my father had hurt other people. And um, it was something that was very hard for me to carry on. I thought, well, if it's me, it's one thing, but if it's somebody else, I felt responsible for that. Um, uh, ashamed of having a father of a pedophile, but I recognized that it was, that I couldn't, I still actually, I still carry a little bit of fault and shame because I know how, intense those feelings are. And I remember one girlfriend or friend, neighborhood friend, and she said, I got a divorce because what your father did for me, I can't, I can't carry a relationship. Um, I could hardly be a mother. Um, I'm just hanging on by my nails. And I have to say, when I heard that, I, I didn't cry because I wanted to hold space for her, but it was devastating for me to hear that. Um, and I still feel terrible for her guilty. And this was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So it is just an awful process to have, uh, go through just in general, I can relate to everybody who, um, has had a life of different forms of mine was physical and sexual and mental and, um, psychological. And I feel I under I have a lot of empathy and understanding for those who suffer. And there's so many people out there in this world that go through that. Yes. The only thing I can say about that is what I've learned um, in life. You know, I'm a mom, I have two adult children. 
Mm -hmm. And um, they've always been my life, my world, you know, and if they're happy, I'm happy. If they're not, I'm not, you know, it's like, it's like that. But, but I've had to release a lot of that, like when they're going through something, I've always, uh, I will be there. But what I had to realize is that every one of us, and if you're a spiritually based, you know, spiritual thinker, every one of us comes in with a goal and a trajectory of how we're going to navigate this earth school process. And we choose our lessons. And so when we try to compensate emotionally or feel guilty for what someone else is going through, it's really kind of useless because they're on a journey just like you are. And we each have to find our way. That's what we have to do. We have to find our way. So for hurting, because child abuse is huge, huge. It's, it's, you know, I was reading, I can't remember what the um, percentage was, but it's something like 7% of American families are not dysfunctional, <laughs> not dysfunctional. <laughs> okay. Wow. So, I mean, everybody's got something that they're dealing with. Hopefully it's not um, as horrific as what you went through, because that is, um, that just destroys your soul, destroys the child. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. your identity. And um, narcissists objectify. And there you were, you were highly objectified. That was it. You were there for his pleasure. Right, right. Or um, yeah, his enjoyment or his entertainment or whatever entertainment. it was he's getting from it. I think I believe that um, it was interesting too that um, there was a time so I was seven or eight and I didn't know how to stop because I was truly I continued because um, my so I'm going to give you a little background so my father um, he would tell me that if I if I broke my secret that my mother would lose her home, that I would lose my, my neighborhood friends that, and I loved my mother and I adored my sister. So they, he took the two things that had the most value in my life and said, I will hurt them. Your mother, my mother was very fear-based and um, uh, she liked her things. Let's just say that she was a very comfortable lady and she didn't want to, she didn't work. She was a typical 70s housewife and um she liked her things and she really truly didn't believe that she could survive without um on her own and i used to plead with her and say please let's just go let's go someplace um i would live on the streets and she i, I think she just thought i was just absolutely crazy but um from here it progressed after it was the fondling it progressed more into um pornographic pictures and my dad would take me out of bed and start taking pictures of me and I was basically clothed um but it, he would set up it, his stage became so elaborate in these pictures um over time I don't even know how my mom didn't know maybe it was a form of denial I believe that I because I, I don't know I have uh, four children and I don't know I mean I could read them from not even looking at their faces. I could read them from just behind, but maybe I had acquired this tool that I could read my children from behind. But I really truly believe that most moms can do that. And so I don't know how my mom didn't see this. And when she found, I gave her a picture because my father um, said, this is going to be a Christmas card. And it was me on a fur rug, uh, but naked, bottom, uh, chest down, and my bottom out with Christmas presents around me. I really did. I thought at this time, I thought it was so normal that this was going to be our family Christmas present or family Christmas card. So I showed it to my mom and my mom well, she lost her mind and she said, where I said, well, dad's been taking pictures of me. And it was, um, she just started rummaging through the house, emptying drawers. And then I showed her the big um, shoe box with all the pictures of me. 
And my mother left. We went into a a women's shelter or a shelter actually in the 70s. They we didn't even have a shelter. There were no laws for um for sec uh, for people uh, that had suffered from sexual abuse. If your hymen was intact, uh, you don't have bruises, then you were perfectly fine. And my hymen was intact. Um, I didn't have bruises. And um, it was my word against his word. And so through this process, my mother left. Um, We were gone for a while, but my father promised to never do it again. And I got placed back in the household and it became worse. Then I started suffering physical abuse and he started controlling me through the physical abuse. And that's how I would run away. And that's how I became. I found that I could only trust the trees where I would run away to the orchards and I could only trust the trees because they had a responsibility of growing in the mud. I knew I could make it if these trees were growing through the mud that I could make it that in nature that they had a purpose and they were there to serve one purpose. Um, The trees were there to uh, provide fruit. And so I thought, okay, I will have a purpose one day. And in this process, I trusted less people. I only trusted the nature. And that's kind of where I realized that I had, um, that I was just a small cog in the wheel of life and that I had a greater purpose and that someday I would come through. But it, it it's terrifying when you don't know who to turn to. And I, I, I did have bruises on my body and my teachers I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what neighbors were thinking. And sometimes I think that a lot of times, I mean, yes, we do have some protection now, but I think a lot of time people just turn, turn their head or they just go, Oh, poor person. And You're the right. abuse just goes on. It's a broken system and it's not much better. <clears throat> what you're describing about, um, parents uh, being in tune with their children Uh, Mm -hmm. because I've come across this several times where I've had a parent come to me and it's clear that their children are being sexually abused and um, they may not have caught them in the act but every single thing points to it the children have said it Um, there's just everything points to it and they generally don't face it and so that's that was very disturbing to me and i was trying to figure out exactly why this happens Mm -hmm. i think one of the reasons and i can't really say exactly why it happens but one of the reasons that it happens is because for a parent to admit that this is true their world world collapses because there's your protector. They're supposed to take care of you. And to admit this means they've destroyed you too. And they can't face it. It's very difficult. So while you and I have children and we, we know every subtlety of mm-hmm. their words, their moods and everything like that, their expressions, um, it's not, we're not defending uh, we're not trying to protect ourselves against something horrific that's happened to them. And so what your mom did is fairly typical until it was really in her face, but also going back is very typical and him, uh, it's called hoovering when they suck you back in because this is what this is what they do. And there's a whole way that they do it. And usually it's by apologizing, pleading, I'll be better, I won't do it again. It's very, very much. But your mother served what I call the enabling spouse role. Mm -hmm. And in my book, Close Encounters of the Worst Kind, I have a whole chapter about the enabling spouse. Because if you have two parents, one is an abuser and one is passive. Yeah. They are enabling that other person to continue that behavior. And often it's because of their own fears and the fears for themselves, their selves, mm-hmm. in these kind of relationships, um, they feel like they can't live without this other person, even when this per- a person is an abuser. And so their 
loyalty is always going to be towards the abuser first because they're trying to save themselves and their relationship. And this is coming from a place of probably childhood or lacking or something like that. Right. And, and this makes the enabling spouse not a very good parent because when given, you know, when push comes to shove, they're not going to stand for you. They're going to stand for them because that's their survival. Um, so often that the enabling spouse is the loving parent, the one who we say, you know, gave us what we needed. The truth of the matter is they didn't really give all that we needed because what you need from a parent is emotional and physical safety. Sure. Everything springboards off of that. Sure. And so yeah. if you're not emotionally safe as a child, it doesn't matter how nice or how giving or how loving or how many times she hugs you or says, I love you or so forth and so on. She's really going to protect herself first, which is a sad commentary on this, it but it's, it's, you know, it doesn't make them bad people, but eventually they get absorbed into the whole thing and, um, and they begin, they, they lose their ability to think for themselves and they become puppets. So I agree with, I completely, completely agree with that. I think um, I realized this in my teen years when I confronted my father, when I, well, um, actually I tried to, I, I thought about, so I had suicidal ideation. And um, when I was having these nightmares and I was, I was journaling and I could put all the nightmares together and I, in splintered pieces. And I recognized that these were not nightmares. These were, this was my life. And um, I came, my dad was a, uh, was a petroleum engineer. So he didn't live with us um, later on in life. He would uh, travel. We were, we, we'd lived overseas and he would travel to, um, at the time it was uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran and he would travel back and forth. So I didn't live with him. So I had some separation from him, but when he came back is when I had, I would have these nightmares and I couldn't figure it out. I knew I didn't like my father. I, I would never choose him as a anybody that I would want to talk to. I thought it was very strange and weird, but that's, that's all that I knew about my father. Um, and that he was domineering. Um, there was really, I, I really had no, no relationship with him at all. I just would just avoid him. Um, my sister was a lot more engaging with my father and listening to him. And I would, um, unfortunately, I would just go, great, I'll let her talk to him. But when I had uh, these nightmares and I had suicidal ideation, um, because I couldn't live with myself knowing that this was my life and I'm stuck in here, I felt like an alien stuck in this household. And how could this be my life? It was just, um, I just wanted my life to end because I couldn't handle the pain. And when I confronted my father and he went through this whole charade, I thought, oh my gosh, like no one's going to fight for me, but myself, no one's going to come to my rescue, but myself. And it was a very isolating um, feeling. And I remember I was extremely disappointed with my mother. I said, uh, you know, like, where's your backbone? Like, why aren't you fighting for me? And um, I, I was very confused during this time and I fell into an incredible deep depression and um, kind of crawled into a hole. And I really tried to find ways of trying to come out and find myself again and find a reason. I remember holding onto this sort of like mantra, like, you're not going to win. <laughs> No, you guys are not going to win. I'm going to win. And that was my mindset of a teenager, but it really kind of saved myself. And I think in that process, I started working on, uh, because I lived in Spain at the time, I couldn't go to the public library. We didn't have the internet. I remember trying to find things that gave me joy. And I started writing them down. Like, what are things that make me feel alive? And I started um, working with mantras to help convince myself that 
that I wasn't this monster where I looked at the mirror, I would tape them up on the mirror and I would say them every time I'd go to the bathroom and brush them or find something inspirational and stick it up there and try to find something. And it was just becoming this, this evolution of how do I save myself? I would write, um, take a shower and I'd write in felt pen um, words that would own me and I would like to wash them off my body. So I would write it on a piece of paper and bring it into the shower and watch them coming off and focus that these words were not owning me. It may own me the next day, but I would do it all over again. And it just started becoming a, a journey of self-healing and I started sharing a little bit more and would kind of step away and in the meantime, try to find just constantly trying to find love for my myself because I did not own it at that point. Once I realized what had happened to me it was um, a terrible thing, a crazy thing for a teenager to go through. It's, yeah. um there's no words to describe how horrible it, it is, what it does to you, the destruction that it does to you um, for the rest of your life. It's very difficult. Yeah, um, it is it is hard to come to terms with the fact that nobody really was protecting you. And, mm -hmm. you know, if your mother saw it, she probably just dissociated or went into I agree. denial. And, you know, denial is people can live in denial for the rest of their life and not face things because it can be very powerful. Um, if that is a tool that you've used to deal with life, if denial is the way you deal with life, then um, you can go through life. You know, I, um, I didn't have a narcissistic mother and I had two older sisters, you know, and um, one of my sisters suffered, suffered, suffered so many years. My mother was so abusive to her. And um, she died fairly young, which is not uncommon because mm. the stress can kill you. I mean, she died around 60 and uh, from Lou Gehrig's disease. And oh. um, I just think she was so tortured inside. But she, yeah. she, a part of her would speak about it, but there was a part of her that still wanted my mother's love. Mm. She wasn't willing to let go of that. And I think that was the torture. I think um, when I'm hearing this, I could relate a lot to this. I feel um, my sister, she's such a beautiful soul. Um, she was always searching, I think, for my mother's love. And there was a lot of love there, too. But for some reason, I um, abandoned it. I just thought that I don't want their love. I don't know how to say that, but it's, I, I did want their love, but I didn't want, if that was loving, then I didn't want it. I think that's kind of what it was exactly. for me. And I remember telling my mom also that, um, that she could live like it, like it's a choice to be in denial and that she's choosing to live her life in denial. And, um, I would say, you know, once I'm able to get out of here, I'm, I'm leaving. And she would always tell me that that was a very selfish thing to do. And I thought, well, then I'm selfish, then I'm selfish, but I'm going to save myself. And I can't, if you are not helping me then, and, or my sister or yourself, then that's a selfish act. And I, I was a little bit of a fiery kid, um, I was also very quiet and demure, um, <laughs> but I had a, a squeaky voice and I really felt compelled to save myself in a crazy, living in a crazy world, but I felt very trapped living in that family. Um, and I, from the outside, we, my, my parents are very educated. Um, it was a beautiful household and abuse happens and it does, there, it doesn't stop. It doesn't, it, it there, you could be anything. And I think that's one of the reasons I recognize that people go, oh my goodness, you never look like you would come from that, that household or. How does um, that look? I, I don't know. I, I would always go, well, what does that mean? And they're going, well, doesn't that happen to homeless people? I would just go, oh my goodness. Or doesn't that happen to this kind of culture? And I would just, 
be dumbfounded, like thinking, no, you have to be human. And that's, this happens that's, all the time. That's the criteria. <laughs> yeah, that's, you just have to be human. And that would just be, that was also something that kind of drove me to like, I've got to say something. Eventually I have to say something. It's it's not, I mean, I found a way through. There's got to be hope um, for, let others know that there's hope for them too, that they could make it through, that you can be educated, that you could come through and also have healthy relationships. And that was a big part of, why I wrote this book and why I talk about this because people don't feel comfortable in talking about the taboo and this happens all the time all the time I think um there's a couple subjects that we don't talk about and one is our sex our sex life and then also I don't believe we talk about our financial life our personal financial life that's really private um so one of my goals is how do we make the discussion around sexual abuse, sexual, uh, any form of abuse, how do we make this um, as common as talking about alcoholism and finding ways so that others could engage in this conversation and we can recognize that we are not alone in this process? Well, you're doing you're doing the right thing. I mean, it's it, it, you're giving a voice to it, and um, if everybody that goes through this eventually gives a voice to it, it helps. I mean, when I started uh, doing narcissistic abuse, there wasn't even an internet. Now every <laughs> Joe out there is is a narcissistic abuse expert or coach or counselor or something like that, a specialist or. A, I mean, there's like everybody's jumped on the bandwagon. This wasn't even known when I started it. Um, hmm. So, you know, so it has a voice. Oh, it has a voice. The problem is there's a lot of um, fraudulent coattail riders <laughs> that are out there doing this. And that upsets me because people who are abused as children need to trust that what they're getting is the right information. They're getting directed. And I think you can pretty much tell, you know, but most therapists don't get this. They just, I don't know about sexual abuse. I know about narcissistic abuse. It's not understood at all by the psych psycho psychological and psychiatric uh, communities. It's not understood. Um, so it's, it's a tough one, Cindy. Uh, so, how do we, what would you say to somebody who's listening to this and they're going through it and they're just having this confusion about, oh my God, this happened to me. I'm so ashamed. What would you say? Don't own your shame. Um, I understand that you have the shame, but try not to own that shame. You are worthy of being loved of loving others and loving yourself and try to release that. It's the shame of somebody else doing something to you. Um, so you should not own that shame. It's the other person's shame. Remove that from your dialogue, from your script. Um, step into your power and really truly find a way to embrace the fact that you are worth loving and you are not alone. There are many, many, many people who suffer this and um, you're beautiful. It's a great message, you know, and I wanted to say, you were talking about you and your sister and um, in my experience, only one child rises up out of these situations. Only one, very, I mean, I can count maybe on three fingers the times where I've seen it, where, where siblings unite, generally one has some kind of clarity, epiphany, strength, fire, whatever you want to call it, that pulls them out. It saves them. It allows them to go through this. <clears throat> but it's rare that all siblings will do that. Um, generally, they sort of 
sometimes they go in closer, mm -hmm. they become needier and more dependent when you start to become independent. And, um, and yeah. So my last uh, question for you is um, one of the things that everybody feels when they go through this and they really can see what has happened to them is they want punishment, they want revenge, they want the person to hurt the way they've been hurt. How did you handle that? So um, when I'm going to go back into my childhood, when I, I must have been around like eight or nine, I wanted to kill my father. And we would have, um, between my sister, and my mom, we would have normal table conversations about how to kill my father. And we would joke about it. We would say, um, oh, maybe we could throw the toaster in the bathtub. You know, he's taking a bath now. And we would joke. Um, but it it made me realize like this, he's a problem and I need to take out my father. Like I need, he needs to be gone. And I actually had, um, it's homicidal. Oh, how do you pronounce that? Homicidal ideation. And I actually um, thought about killing my father in revenge because I felt that this man was poisoning our household and he could not be stopped. And I brought in the butter knives into my bed and practiced stabbing, stabbing my pillow. But I realized there were ribs and I could not, I didn't know how to get through that in the dark. Um, I thought about poisoning him because I knew we had some rat poison in the in the uh, cupboard high up in the garage. I thought about putting the poison into his coffee, but then my sister used to sip the his coffee sometimes and I didn't want to poison her. But I mean, I really did want to get rid of my father. But, and I started acting out violently and I started to recognize that within this violence, I started hitting back and I recognized that I was saying the same things that he was saying. I was hitting him, um, fighting just like him. And I had lost my mind. I had become the same monster that I was living with. Wow. And I, I thought... I am my father and it terrified me. And in that process, I thought, well, okay, I hurt. Why would I hurt somebody else? Um, that, why, why would I hurt somebody else? And I thought, okay, he just, he's the bully in the playground. I mean, I kept on trying to relate it to my child. He's the bully in the playground. And I thought I have to work smarter and be smarter about this. And it's got to start with me and I will not, I mean, I will defend myself, but, um, killing, <laughs> killing him was not the solution I would, and I couldn't share it with my parents, but so that's where, that's what I would say. You have to like make a conscious choice of how much revenge, like, and it's a toxic thing to get to that state. And I remember that I'm still fearful that actually we could all turn into these crazy animals. Mm -hmm. And then you have to realize like, to what, to what end, you know, who do you want to be and who do you want to show up in life? Do you, you know, you have to recognize what is it that you want out of life and who are you? And do you want to be this monster that you are trying to run away from? It starts to become a reflection of like, look at yourself in the mirror. You know, it became a life goal of not, becoming like him. Mm -hmm. Also my sister too, I have to say we ended up becoming very close and she's a therapist. And this is something that she really worked on too. We didn't really find this until later on in life together. And we joined and um, it was interesting. She handled things differently at the end with my father um, than I did. And um, it, it's okay. We always ended up in the same spot mm -hmm. and it was um, a willingness, I think, to be be better, be greater than ourselves. Wow, so well said. Thank you. That is that's that was perfect. Yeah, I mean, when we even when we get away from our abusers, we still carry them in our head, 
and we've got to get them out of our head. They, they, they're still maneuvering for us, you know, even though mm -hmm. they're not there um, because it's so deep seated in our subconscious that we're still once they stop abusing us, we begin to abuse ourselves in a sense. But, you, right. you know, you I love what you said. Um, that's. I think that's very validating for people to understand that it's OK to have that rage. Mm -hmm. It's okay to want to, um, you know, do something, revenge. first that yeah. person, revenge. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, just um, um, I'm going to be doing a retreat uh, on divorcing a narcissist in October um, at a very, very nice place. And one of the um, things that we're going to be doing there, this place actually has hatchet throwing. So. <laughs> One of the yeah one of the past times so we're going to have them bring pictures of this person mm -hmm. throw hatchets at it you know i think that could be... <laughs> that's that's that when i heard about that i'm like oh hands down this is the place uh, this is the place but, right um that's just one little part of it but anyway okay so your book um under the orange blossoms mm -hmm. was is beautifully written and uh cindy where do we get this book um, Amazon, I would, I, I think most people go to Amazon, um, but Barnes and Noble, um, any, uh, place that sells books really, honestly, it's, it's out. Um, also, um, yes. So it's, it's Amazon. I would recommend Amazon. I think that's what most people go through, but it's Barnes and Noble. Um, yes. As long as it has an ISBN number, anybody can order it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have a website or uh, do you work with people? Uh, I do not work with people. I have a blog. Um, it's uh, uh, www.cindytalks.com. Uh, and um, I always enjoy having responses. Um, I recently just started this this work. Um, I am an event planner, but I'm kind of putting that on the side a little bit more. And I feel more passionate about this. Uh, this is a, a calling of mine to find and collaborate with others who are healers like yourself and um, trying to find a voice for those who have suffered forms of abuse and trauma and uh, finding making this voice a louder one and finding a collaborative um, voice to find solutions. And then also a, a place of healing. I think when we unite with others who I'm going to use, it's a, it's a, ter it's, a it's not the best word, but I'm going to say, as we feel broken to find like souls in this spot, then we realize that we are not broken. We are, we have actually survived and we are whole. So I think that's a good place to be. And there's so many of, of people that um, girls and boys, men and women, um, we st it stops at no gender. No, it doesn't. No, mm -mm. it doesn't, unfortunately. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for sharing your story and um, really giving us that um, initiative and incentive and inspiring us to maybe think about this in a different way, reach out for help. And um, it, it, you can heal from this. Mm -hmm. And I always say to people, I mean, this isn't just the thing that releases them, but um, do you want this person to run your life anymore? Right. You know, just, because if you don't, then it's time that we cut it. Right. We cut loose. So that's mm -hmm. this person isn't because they will run your life until you do something about it. And um, and I'm glad that you sought out therapy and you found benefit in it. It it's this is not something you can do yourself. I, I'm sorry. It's really not. It's very difficult. You need a sounding board. You need somebody mm -hmm. to give you a different perspective. To bounce off of so um you've done it all right and you're you're just doing so well and i understand why this is a passion for you 
it's a passion for me too. It's not easy work, but it's, I can't imagine doing anything else. Right. So, well, we're worth saving, aren't we? Definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We're here for a reason. We are. And I, I just want to say, Randy, you are a, a very um, articulate and bright woman. And when you, I, I love the way you put your thoughts and your words, it's very thoughtful. Um, I appreciate that. I learned a lot for you today. So Good. thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. You're very, very welcome. So um, I appreciate that. So anyway, it's been wonderful. Have a great day. Um, and um, just keep keep trugging along, keep grabbing people, make that train of sexually abused people heal, let them all get together. And, <laughs> um, and let's, let's, let's work on this problem. Thank you. Sounds wonderful. Bye. All right. Thank you.